Part of this episode was filmed on location at a school. We extend our thanks to Another Way School in Park City and the class participants. Generally, I speak of classroom management as managing materials and information, and leadership is the skill of guiding behavior. Sometimes, however, management includes managing the interactions of a group. This segment covers the essential classroom skills of modeling the behaviors you want to teach are appropriate and only reinforcing appropriate behaviors during group time. As we continue in our discussion of classroom management, I do want to mention some things about managing the children when you're in a group setting. The footage that we have as a part of this program of the line helps understand some ways to focus the children toward the behavior that is appropriate and respectful on the line. When a child raises his or her hand and doesn't wait for me to say their name before I, I call on them, I usually simply ignore them. Even if they call out an answer, if we're identifying cards or something on the line, I will just ignore that answer and call on another child. This usually pretty quickly gives the child the message that this is not an effective behavior. We'll talk a little bit more in a minute about not rewarding bad behavior or behavior that is disrespectful to others, and this is an example of that. They simply find that it doesn't work. It's also an example of where ignoring works really, really well. There's no need to tell them that. You can simply ignore the behavior. Now, occasionally I will have a child decide they're going to try and get around me ignoring them, and they will point at the, the correct answer if I've got cards out on the floor or something, and in that case, then I may need to give that child a forced choice. Would you like to keep your hands to yourself when it's not your turn to give the answer, or would you like to sit on the chair away from the line? Those are your choices. So those are some ways that, to manage that kind of behavior. One of the other things that you do need to make sure that you're doing when you have the children on the line, particularly if you are showing them something, either demonstrating a lesson or showing cards or other materials, you need to make sure that everyone can see. Usually, one of the requirements on the line is that the children choose a place. If the line is a physical line on the floor, they may have an assigned place. They may simply need to be on the line itself and not touching others or not crowding others. In the, the classroom with the example tape that, that I have, there was actually a, a beautiful Navajo rug that had been donated to the school, and the designs included diamonds and triangles that sort of help the children to space themselves and they are instructed that when they come to the line they're to sit on a diamond or a triangle if there's one empty and that just sort of spaces them around the line so they're not crowding each other. In order to make it easy for them to follow that guideline, in order to make that boundary appropriate and not frustrating for them to, to stay within, you have to make sure while staying on their place they can see what you're showing. This is some of the feedback that I would give to the assistant teacher who was giving the demonstration with the simple machines. Because he had the machines off to, to his side, the children on this side of the line had trouble seeing and thus, understandably so, were, were kind of moving closer and closer, which of course creates a problem because when they move out of their space, they then become uh, an obstruction that another child can't see what's going on. Now, if that assistant teacher, Mr. Logan, looks a little bit familiar, it may be because you have seen him in another segment of this program. The three-year-old little boy that was filmed in 1986 is the same person. Um, through a, a series of events that started with him receiving a hand injury and the school that I was, was a part of needing some staffing, he ended up taking an assist, a temporary assistant teaching position which was a really interesting and enjoyable and, and just all around good happenstance for the children that we both were teaching and for the chance for us to teach together. During that time, it helped me to see what sometimes goes into a child's mind in the Montessori environment that might surprise you. He hasn't done any teaching outside of the martial arts from the time that he was a three-year-old and, and older in the Montessori classroom and this particular position. But the things that came naturally to him, the way of treating the children with respect, the way of not intervening inappropriately in some of the things that would happen in the classroom, I believe were very much because that's the way he was treated at that same age. 
So I, I thought that was a, an interesting little aside that, that I would actually point out in, in the footage that we are, are including in this program just because it's kind of a fun thing to, to have happen, to have a child be your student and your child in the classroom and then be able to assist you for a short time in that very different role of being the assistant teacher. On the line, it is essential that you make it easy for the children to obey the rules. They're very young. They don't have very long attention spans, and so letting them move, letting them make choices, letting them participate helps to expand their, their attention span. We read a lot of books on the line, and one of the things that I tend to do is go back and forth between just picture books that are easy for them atten to attend to, you know, seeing each picture as we, we read just a, a small portion of the book, and then a little bit longer. We just recently read Charlotte's Web in the classroom that I'm working with. And so that did stretch the children's attention a little bit more. There were a few illustrations that they got to see, but there was a lot of listening and a lot, uh, an extended out time to get the whole story, to get the, the whole sense of, of what was happening in the book. This is also probably a good time for me to mention the role of fantasy and how to deal with that in your school. I have found that most of the children I have taught over the years are exposed to fantasy in so many different ways that ex just explaining to them the difference between fantasy and reality is the best way to approach it. I don't do a lot of fairy stories and things like that on the line with three to six year old children because I don't think it's appropriate to feed that a lot. Something like Charlotte's Web in my experience is a little different. For one thing, the children are aware that, that there is a quality of communication that animals have that some people are more sensitive to. So how much of Charlotte's Web is fantasy? Well, certainly the dialogue is and the explicit nature of the animals' conversations, and they're aware of that as well. One of the things I do my best to do is help sort out fantasy from reality for the children in a way that helps them. Uh, we sing about monsters and things like that to kind of take off some of the edge, to help them realize that some of the things that might be scary to them aren't real, and so they can, can kind of relax with that. So even though I may introduce more fantasy into my classroom than some Montessori teachers do, it is with attention to that, that concept that the children aren't ready to deal with fantasy on their own. They aren't ready to read fairy tales on their own. They, they need uh, a guide to help them sort out what's real and what's not real and, what's, what, and what to do with that, how, how to place that in their minds. Today, we are talking about some simple machines. Now, these simple machines are what make bigger machines like cranes and dump trucks work. So the first simple machine we're going to talk about is a pulley. So Maggie, I would like you to come over and work on the pulley with me. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is put over just one of our wheels. Pull on this one until this one comes all the way to the top. Okay, feel how hard you have to pull. Okay, so now we're going to try it with two of our wheels. And now pull on it, see if it makes a difference to have two wheels. Hold on. Does it feel like it goes easier now? Okay, let's try it with all three wheels. Just pull on it. Just pull on it. It goes pretty easy now, doesn't it? So the more wheels we use, the less energy it takes to move our weight from one side to the other. So a pulley is a way to help lift heavy objects without taking as much energy. So that is a pulley. Thank you, Maggie. The next simple machine we're going to talk about is called an inclined plane. Can everybody say that? Inclined plane. Thank you. Okay, an inclined plane. Oh, jeez. The awesome. The cool. Okay. Now, we have our inclined plane. And an inclined plane is, is a way to generate energy because we have our hill, our hill and our car will roll down the hill. Now if we have a steeper hill then our car will go faster because it's a steeper hill. But it also means that more energy is required to move up. So the more steep that our hill is, 
the more energy required to pull it up, and the more energy created to roll back down. Does everyone understand that? Yes. Okay. I'll show it The next simple machine is the simplest of them all, the wedge. This is a machine called a wedge. A wedge has a skinny end on one end, and it gets wider, and it is used to move between two objects and separate them. If you notice, when we move it between the two parts of our inclined plane, it separates it. Okay? Very simple. Now that we've talked about our inclined plane, let's talk about our screw. Everybody say screw. Screw. Okay. Let's come here for a moment, please. When you look at our screw, can you see that the thread on our screw goes uphill towards the top? It's another inclined plane. When you look inside the hole, do those look like they would match up pretty well with this? So when we turn our screw into our block, go ahead and pull on that screw, see if it comes off. Does it come off? Okay, but then turn it and see how easy it moves. Okay, so this is a way to hold things together because if it's being pulled, it will hold for a very long time, but it requires very little energy to unscrew our screw. Okay. We've been talking about energy a lot, and this is called a gear train. Carter, would you like to come work on the gear train with me? You're going to be the battery of our gear train. You're going to provide the energy. So I'd like you to turn this very slowly. And watch what happens to the other wheels. Okay, now turn it fast. Okay, so what does everybody notice about the speed of this wheel compared to the speed of this wheel? When I move it slow, raise your hand and tell me, um, it moves very fast. Now, if I move it fast, it moves fast. But if I move it slow, what happens to the other wheels? Go slow. Exactly. So this is a way to transfer the energy that we use to move this wheel to this wheel. So it's a way to move energy down the gear train. Carter, can you go back to your seat? simple machine we're going to talk about is called a lever. It has two parts. Lever. Everybody say lever. 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 Fulcrum. Fulcrum. The fulcrum is the middle point of our lever. So, Liam, would you like to help me with my lever? Okay, so with these notches, we're going to make a short lever first, and Liam is going to use the lever to pick up the screw. Push down until you pick up the screw. Now, that, did that take a lot of energy to pick it up? Okay, so let's try moving our lever on our fulcrum and have a bigger lever and now try to pick it up. Okay, so now we're going to use an even bigger lever and he's going to pick it up again. And so which one was the easiest, Liam? Was that the easiest or was it easier to have a bigger lever to pick it up? Bigger lever. Okay, so the farther the lever goes from our fulcrum, the less energy it takes to lift what is on the other side of our lever. Cool. So these are the basic, simple machines that make up everything that we do. Sound good? Yeah. Thank I you very much for your attention, you guys. Thank you, Mr. Logan. And let me tell you what's going to happen with the simple machines. The simple machines aren't something that we have out in school all the time because they're kind of bulky. They usually stay up on those shelves up there. Have some of you noticed them up there? But what will happen is next week they will be out on those shelves behind Carter and Nicholas so that you'll be able to use them and experiment with them and, and see how they work. Yeah, and do you okay? know about that simple? What about Carter, that one? thank you for right raising your there. hand. Well, we haven't given a lesson with that one, so you won't be using it yet, will you? Sometimes we put some things out on the shelf for you to use, and then they switch around. Is the, let's see, what's some work that's been put away? Um, is the bear puzzle out on the shelf anymore? No. 
but now is there insect work out on the shelf? Yes. Is that nice to have work go away and have something else come in instead? You like that? Okay. So let's go ahead and do some work with our animals. Friends on the line, who's talking on the line? The teacher. Keegan? Who's talking on the line? Me, the teacher. And who else gets to talk? When is it your turn to talk? When you raise your hand and I call your name, that's right. What kind of animals are these? Zach? That's right, they're insects. And how do we know they're insects? Can anybody tell me how we know these are insects and they're not something else? Carter, thank you for raising um, your hand. I forget their names, but those... The antennas, that's actually a hint. There aren't very many kinds of animals that have antennas, so that is one of the hints that they're insects, that they are insects. How many legs do insects have? Carter? Six. That's right. That's how we can tell these are insects. So let's see what else we have here. Starfish. Well, okay. So is everything insects now? No. No, because we have a starfish and we have a turtle. Well, let's get rid of those. So now we know that those are insects. So if you remember the name of the insect that I point to, you can raise your hand. Maggie? Um. I'll come back to you. Um, Liam? Cricket. That is a cricket. And remember, when we look at our cricket and our grasshopper, how do we tell which is the cricket? What tells us that this is the cricket? Jackson? Uh, what, that one. what color is the cricket? Uh, black. Yeah, so is, if it's black, is it probably a cricket? If it's brown or green, what probably is it? A grasshopper. What is it if it's brown or green? Green. What is it if it's brown or green? Maggie, thank you for raising your hand. That's right, it's a grasshopper. Okay, now this is one that we just added into our set, but I bet you know what it is, Carter. Ladybug. That's right, it is a ladybug. How about this one? Zach? Housefly. It is a housefly, and you were very specific. That is the kind of fly it is. So let's go ahead and say our insects together, and then we'll put them away, and we'll go on to our songs. Dragonfly. Right? Friends, we're going to say it all together. So when I point, let's say it all together. Dragonfly, ladybug, housefly, cricket, Firefly, good. You remember it. Cricket. Oh, I messed up. How do I know that's not a cricket? Grasshopper. It is a grasshopper. Cockroach. Honeybee. Okay, you're remembering your insects really well. Someone has a song they'd like to sing. Would you raise your hand, Zach? What would you like to sing? The next segment shows how to do a small group phonics or symbols cards lesson, usually with three to five children, but was done with the whole group for ease in filming. So friends, what we're going to do, we're going to do a real short version of small group because we didn't have a chance to do that today. So we're going to start with our numbers and then we'll do some letter sounds and then we'll do our animals. Okay, so remember, me first, then you, and then we'll do them all together, right? Now, if you sit down on your diamonds and your triangles, I'll make sure that you can see from where you are. Friends, should you be touching your friends on the line? Where should your hands be? On your own body or to yourself? Keegan? Oh, were you stretching? Excuse me, I thought you were raising your hand. Okay, so I'm going to say it, and then you say it after me. Eight. Eight. One. One. Nine. Nine. nine five, five, five. Five. Six. Six. six three. Please, car. It's no. not a three? No. Okay, I see some people who forgot to sit on the diamonds. I know mm -hmm. when we get a little silly, it's easy to forget. You know, 
I think you're right. I think that is a police car. Well, let's see if we have a number for the next one. Ten. 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 Four. Four. Two. Two. Three. Three. Seven. Seven. Eight. Eight. Okay, now you do them with me. Eight. Eight. One. Nine. Five. Six. six. Are you watching the numbers? Police car. Police car. Ten. Four. Two, three, seven, eight. Good job. Okay, now we're just going to do a few of our sounds because some of you are really getting ready to read. So a lot of you are getting ready to work on your vowel sounds. Maggie, did you have a question? I was just stretching. You were stretching. Okay, friends. Well, sometimes if you stretch on the line, maybe you can stretch down. So I won't think you have a question. So we're going to do the sounds of the vowels. So would you do them with me? Ah, ah, i, 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 uh, uh, ah, 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 eh, eh. Star. What are those pictures doing in with my cards? Okay, now if you know them, you can say them with me. Otherwise, you can just listen. sounds, but those are the sounds that we learn first as we're first learning how to read. In working with the children in a group, it's really important to realize that you cannot personalize things the way you can in an individual lesson. For this reason, be careful. Be careful in requiring the children to come and, and be in a group together. Uh, make it an option where you can with the logistics of, of your teaching situation. Remember that when you're working with one child, you can adjust continually based on the feedback that child is giving you. If you're working with a group, you need to go kind of to the least common denominator in regard to attention. So as soon as anybody's getting wiggly, you need to be ready to shift gears so that you either require more involvement of the children and let them have a little bit more movement, or you move toward ending that time where they're being required to sit and attend all together. Now, in regard to small group, I do consider this to be a very worthwhile way to add still another period to the Montessori three period lesson. You, you've seen in other parts of this program that I talk about that period zero is the sensorial preparation where the child learns how to use the hand and the eye to be and the ear to even be prepared to associate a name to something that you're showing them. What the small group, the way that, that I've shown you this, this way of, of working does, is gives a little auditory extra piece. So before the child is required to say the name of the object, they're able to say it with a group where there's no pressure at all. It's a little bit like an auditory version of period two in the second period lesson. So when you say, show me red, show me blue, show me yellow, the child doesn't have to pull that word out of their brain, all they have to do is pull the association out. Now, in some ways, small group is period two and a half because they're making those associations, but now they're going to get a little bit of practice in actually saying them, in putting the words together or associating the sound with speaking the sound out with what they're seeing without any pressure of having to make that choice or being able to say, what is this? What is this t? Before we're asking them to do that, we're saying t all together. We're practicing that. Again, in some ways, this is a part of what I've referred to in other areas as remedial Montessori. If the children had all that sound preparation that's supposed to come before they're even introduced to the letter symbols, that might not be necessary. For those children that didn't have that preparation, this is another way to just make that that isolation of the new concept even more clear so there's only a little bit of a stretch, a little bit of a challenge that each hap it happens at each step along the way.